Today we continue our series on the good news according to John the Apostle. If you were with us last week, we saw that Jesus taught us the functions of the Holy Spirit, not only within believers, but also within the world. In John chapter 16, verse 15, he said, All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, The Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and he teaches us exactly what Christ wants us to know. And our scripture today is John chapter 16, verses 16 through 33. And it's starting on page 1678 in the Pew Bible. Jesus shows us today three key words that keep us going. So follow along as I read, starting in verse 16. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to be with the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, then after a little while you will see me? Very truly I tell you, or it is true, it is true, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her part of the joy a child has been born, born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but I will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you, and you, as you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered into the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe, Jesus replied? A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now this is one of Jesus' last occasions for teaching his disciples as the evening draws to a close. The final moments of tranquility among friends would soon, to, soon, to, soon turn to anguish as a venture out to Gethsemane. The injustice during prosecution, the cruel ridicule, the brutal scourge, scourging, followed by his death through the crucifixion, one of the most difficult deaths to suffer. Yet despite his desire for comfort and encouragement, Jesus continued to comfort and encourage his followers. He was selfless to the end. Jesus offered three promises to keep his disciples grow, going in this looming shadow of the cross, as the dark days darkened for them. These promises can be reduced to just three words that are also helpful for us today. Those three words are joy, verses 16, or 19 through 24, love, verses 25 through 28, and peace, verses 31 through 33. As we examine these promises from Jesus, that joy, love, and peace, take note on the central place given to prayer, when we claim to have joy, love, and peace. As we start in verse 16, Jesus offered his disciples somewhat of a pessimistic prediction, but then followed with a positive promise. He said, you will no longer see me, and this is what worried the disciples so much, because it predicted his imminent death on the cross. Then he says, in a little while, you'll see me. Promises his appearance through the resurrection. The phrase, in a little while, prohibits the possibility that he was actually talking about his second coming at the end of days, 
He meant the time between his crucifixion when he rose again and when he ascended to heaven. That was the little while he was speaking of. In your bulletin, insert on the side where it says prediction-promises formula. And as joy in the morning, the graphic at the top. The prediction, prom prediction promise formula establishes a definable pattern for the remainder of this discussion with Jesus and his remaining 11 disciples. Their dialogue follows this pattern of discussion as I've listed there. First, they had a prediction and a promise, that promise of his resurrection in verse 16. The disciples react to that. Then he had the prediction and the promise of joy, verses 19 through 24. Then he went on to have a prediction and a promise of love, verses 25 through 28. Then the disciples reacted again. And then finally had a prediction and promise of peace, verses 31 through 33. As we move on to 17 and 18, the disciples were not unlike, say, a six-year-old at a funeral. That six-year-old can only handle so much details about what is taking place at that point. Therefore, Jesus prepared them in this dip, for this difficult hour the best that he could, but they were like the six-year-old at a funeral. They could only comprehend so much. Unfortunately, the disciples had become so agitated with the, pros the, the prospect of us going away that nothing would console them, not even the promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Jesus tried to keep the matter as basic or bottom line as possible. When he said, a little, in a little while you will see me no more, then after a little while you will see me. Yet, even this, the disciples didn't fully understand, and it caused them anxiety. As we move on to verses 19 through 24, that first key word today is joy. Jesus predicted the disciples would experience intense sorrow, while the world would be celebrating a perceived victory. Of course, the reference about his imminent suffering, death, and burial were real. However, the ordeal illustrates an excellent principle for us living in what's called the last days. In a little while, we will see Christ again, no matter whether it's 2,000 years or 20,000 years, whatever God's timeline is. That time when Christ will come back and restore his global Eden to here to earth. But during this interval, during this beautiful in-between time, we wonder about all the issues going around, but this is the church age, this is the age of grace, this is what's referred to in the scripture when Christ refers to the last day. It's any period between his resurrection and when he comes again to restore his global Eden. But during these last days, we'll experience sorrow. Loved ones will be lost to us. Our bodies will contract diseases. Innocent people will suffer persecution. Meanwhile, if we just look at it, we see that malicious people prosper and the evil appears to enjoy the spoils of victory. But we must keep in mind, our perception of time is not what God's is. It's just a little while, and then he will return. Jesus followed a prediction with a promise. The world's victory celebration, even in his day, would come to an abrupt end when the Son of God would be vindicated through his resurrection and his own, those of us who have put our faith in Christ, have chosen to do so, will be vindicated with them. The sorrow of believers will then be turned to joy. The Lord illustrated his promise in a poignant image of a woman suffering the intense pain of childbirth. Now, I can't imagine that pain, but I've witnessed it five times, and I know it's not easy. Not coincidental, that was one of the curses of the fall in Genesis chapter 3.16. And as that pain grows, a transition from sorrow to joy comes close. Then in an instant, the greatest of all human suffering, that occasion is now for the greatest of all joys. The affliction of the curse yields new life, a new child born into the world. And in verse 23, it says, in that day, refers to an era after his resurrection, but before his ascension specifically, it was a time where the disciples would rejoice because Christ, who they thought and lost all hope because he died, came back to life. And he was with them for a period of about 40 days. And while the reason for the joy cannot be taken for granted or taken away, there isn't a condition implied here. It means 
that we experience this joy only through prayer. Once the atoning sacrifice has been made, once the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world did his part by being an atoning sacrifice for us, the barrier between humanity and God was removed. If you'll remember in the temple, there was the holy place and then the most holy place or the holy of holies where only the priest, high priest went and only once a year. And then there was this thick veil hanging between those two sections. And when Christ died on the cross, that veil was torn asunder from top to bottom, opening up the most holy place, the holy of holies to everyone who believes. Believers are granted access to the Father between, up to the, because of the Son. Anything that we ask that agrees with God's will, in my name, Jesus said, will be given. The intimacy of prayer will result in joy, and joy to its fullest measure. Takes us to our second key word today, verses 25 through 28, which is love. Jesus predicted that the need for his teaching would be done through figurative language, and that figurative language would now start to disappear. The Greek ter word or term John used to describe Jesus' obscure manner of speaking was means a byword. It's something that means something else. And in this sense, a byword is any term that tries to, de to describe a complex technical meaning. For instance, if I might say to someone, the annuity of your lifestyle is about to mature. Now to most of us, we'd say, what? What does that mean? Well, for a financial planner who deals with annuities and understands them very well, would be familiar with that concept, he will instantly understand the metaphor, the point that I'm trying to make. The result of a person's choices throughout their lifestyle, or throughout their life, will come to fruition. That person will harvest what they planted. If they, har if they planted good seed, they'll harvest good seed. If they planted evil seed, Oh, harvest evil seed. That's what the annuity of your lifestyle is about to mature. Jesus needed to be cautious on how he dealt with the disciples and how much he shared with them, but it was for their own good because they were like that six-year-old at a funeral parlor, not fully grasping what has taken place. His purpose for using the technical terms is much like prophecy of the Old Testament. Most People of Jesus' day didn't understand the prophecy as it was really written. There was a already meaning for prophecy, and then there was a not yet meaning, which was fulfilled many times, much of that prophecy, when Christ came to earth. He had given them hope for future trials, and he wanted to equip them for, with obedience. The meaning of the words became clear as events start to unfold, during the next few days when Jesus was crucified, in the days between his resurrection and Pentecost, when he received the Spirit, they gradually unfolded to them. And when the Spirit came, it gave them supernatural understanding of what had taken place. And those cowardly disciples that were hidden behind the locked doors all of a sudden were in the public square preaching boldly that Christ was the Messiah. In verse 26, we see the same phrase, in that day, and it has the same meaning as verse 23. Under the old covenant, people approached God through the priesthood. The divinely appointed officials in the temple were mediators in the relationship between man and God as they worshipped. During Jesus' ministry, he became the physical means of that human-divine relationship. People approached Jesus for miracles, for divine teaching, for God's revelation, and to be forgiven for their sins. Jesus promised that after his resurrection, he would become the permanent bridge between humanity and God. The sacrifice that Jesus gave for us was that bridge where there was a chasm before where we could not approach God. In the Old Testament, it had to be through the high priest. Through Jesus' day, it was through Jesus here physically, but today, because of Jesus' sacrifice, he becomes that bridge where once the veil was rendered asunder, 
we can now approach God directly into the Holy Holies because of the bridge that Jesus Christ has, has provided for us, the lamb that took away the sins of the world. Through him, in his name it says, if you pray anything in my name, and we might wonder, well, why do we end our prayers in Jesus' name or in Jesus' precious name? It's because of this passage here. Because Christ says, if you pray anything in my name, according to God's will, then it will happen. He characterized the unrestricted access to God and the Father as a welcome and response from God as God's love. Through prayer, believers enjoy that love relationship with the Father and we're no longer hindered by our unpunished sin because Christ has become that bridge to cross that chasm. And the means of the free exchange of love now between us and God is through prayer. Jesus has become our intercessor. He's become our bridge. He stands before God and we pray in his name. We are completely holy, completely blameless before God now. Verses 29 through 30, you can find the response of the disciples somewhat charming. And I'm sure the Lord probably thought the same. Note the use of the word now, they finally understood the response of in that, in that day. They gained a small glimpse of knowledge, but who, like a teenager, 15 or 16 year old who thinks they know it all, no more than their parents, no more than their grandparents, no more than every adult on the globe, the disciples only had a glimpse of what true knowledge of God would be like. Now their statements of the deity of Jesus Christ, their exclusive claim on truth was spot on, but they only understood it in a limited manner right then. Later they would come to understand it more fully. When the Holy Spirit filled them, the disciples would fully appreciate the ministry and the wonder of God's incarnation, what Christ, that Lamb of God, did for them. They were like toddlers at a performance of Handel's Messiah. They might hear the sounds and see the sights of, the, of that Messiah, of the Handel's Messiah, but the depth and the breadth of the meaning could only come through maturity. A young toddler doesn't fully appreciate what's being done then. And the third key word today, verses 31 through 33, is the key word of peace. Jesus welcomed disciples' breakthrough. The dialogue has been a long series in that upper room that night of fear and reassurance, fear and reassurance. And these cycles were going throughout the night as Jesus had gave them their final teachings. However, the disciples stepped away decidedly from fear and they say, now we understand. We're coming to the least to that knowledge. They did not know nearly as much as they assumed, just like the teenager I mentioned a moment ago. So they responded with to the, another prediction and a promise. Jesus predicted the disciples would soon abandon him, and they thought, surely not. Undoubtedly, thinking Jesus was thinking about the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, where he says, all have turned away from me. He said, a time is coming and has in fact come. At that moment, Judas, think about that night, they were about ready to leave that upper room, and Judas was then with the, high, the priest of the temple, gathering a mob, lighting their torches, ready to head out to Gethsemane. They would soon surround that garden and capture the, that person they thought was an enemy of not only God, but of the, of the Roman Empire. He followed their gloomy prediction, though, that everyone will turn away from me with a promise. While all of humanity would soon abandon Jesus, including his beloved disciples, the Father would remain faithful. Jesus later cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. And this is not to implicate that the Father was abandoning him completely. Instead, it was Jesus fulfilling that prophecy that David wrote about in Psalm chapter 22, where he said, uttered the same, same words. While the emotional anguish of the cross was accurately ref reflected in the Lord's lament, that in that state where he became the sacrifice for us all, 
he felt abandoned by everyone. He, like David, though, knew that the Father had not abandoned him. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are one, and nothing can divide that triune God. Jesus further promised, so that, you, so that in me you may have peace. The peace is not only the peace with God, which we're to told in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It's a subjective kind of peace also, the peace that we can have, despite the chaos of living in this world today, this hostile world, we may, in the midst of that, experience tranquility. However, this too was conditional. Like joy, there's a condition behind having peace. Peace is available, but we must choose it. We choose to have peace when we believe in Christ that he will overcome the world. Now, you might recall John's statement in the prologue, chapter 1, verse 5, we went over weeks and weeks ago. It says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And the Greek term here for extinguish is a deliberately ambiguous in chapter 1, but it can also mean to overpower. But in this particular context where he says that he has overcome the world, it's an unambiguous verb. It's nikeo in the Greek. It means to conquer. John opened the, his narrative to summarize Jesus' entire ministry on earth, and then he ends it here. But in that chapter 1, verse 5, he says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never conquer it. He concluded the Lord's teaching ministry by saying, I have overcome the world. Jesus challenged his disciples, and us by extension, he says, but take heart. And the Greek word here means to dare, to be bold, to be of good courage, to be cheerful and confident, to take heart. And definition could also use two other nuanced meanings, to trust in or rely on, and the second is to be bold against someone or something. It's to go out bravely against someone. As a Star Trek enthusiasm, enthusiast, what came to my mind is to boldly go where no man has gone before. We can have that kind of faith as we go forth in the world. The entire range of meanings is appropriate to the Lord's exhortation. His victory over the world, over sin, evil, Satan, death, and the twisted manner in which the world operates gives us a reason to throw ourselves headlong into our lives, to boldly go where others are afraid to go. It gives us a reason not to have fear. Because even if we were to die in this world because we're being persecuted for Christ, ultimately we live. Joy, love, and peace is ours. If only we choose to believe him. So the question we need to ask each of us, do we believe? And that takes us to our application today on the other side of your bulletin insert, the three key words that keep us going on some of them, I left off the G, so it might say three key words that keep us going. So, if somehow we could put ourselves in the skin of those disciples at night to relive what it must have been like to be at that table, to hear the teaching of Jesus at night, and to hear him pray for us before we left that room, which will be next week's message. And then to walk down those steps out of the upper room and find their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe two thoughts might settle over us at that point. First, Jesus' life may not have been long, but his death was not a mistake. And second, our life may not be easy, but we can go on. By the end of his dialogue, Jesus said in effect, I promise you life in this world is going to be difficult. But I have overcome the world. Nevertheless, you can be more than conquerors because of my power. He showed them how to persevere in joy, triumph in, pe triumph in love, and to live in peace. As Romans chapter 8, verse 37 tells us, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So now it brings us to a series of questions that we need to ask ourselves. Do you have joy that cannot be taken away? Do you have confidence in God's love? Are you confident in the truth that he is here for you? 
Can you rest confidently in his wisdom and say to him, Lord, you know everything, so I'm not questioning you any longer. Whatever happens, I know it's according to your will. And when life comes crashing down, do the qualities of joy, love, and peace, are they God's gift that keep us going? It'd be like having a full bank account with all the money that you would ever need and could have possibly spend, but then not drawing against it to live. That it was what it's like to have God's presence in us, but then not utilizing that power. The gifts of joy, love, and peace require faith. And if we fail to trust the promises of God, then it leads to a lack of joy, a failing love, and an unsteady peace. So let's briefly look at those. If we don't have the faith, we're failing to trust. The first failing, failing to trust is the lack of joy. We lack joy when evil gains an upper hand in our lives, and we worry that that evil will become permanent in our lives. But what if we knew that every trial that we faced, that when we came out on the other side of it, it would be something better? What if we lost a job only to know that the next job we would have would be a better job and a much higher paying job? What if when we contracted a disease, we would know that we would come out of that disease not only healthier, but our lifespan extended? What would happen if you had financial ruin and knowing when you came out on the other side that you would have more wealth than you ever have had? Would it keep it going? How would you regard each affliction after that if you knew the outcome was going to be even better than what you have now? But we have little faith. Would we face those afflictions with dread or anticipation? Say, yeah, Lord, get me through this again. I'm on the upward way. Would you face it with gloom or with joy? How would you, your belief affect how you're reacting to your ability to persevere through tribulations? While the world that I've just described is not reality in one way when we're here on earth, in another way it is. The Lord has not promised to make us healthy and wealthy or even wise, but God has promised us that he has overcome evil and we will receive a far greater blessing than we can ever imagine in the life to come. Afflictions here on earth will eventually give way to the eternal life we'll have forever. In the meantime, the blessings that we gain from the afflictions is a healing for our soul. And it's helped us to increase our spiritual health. We persevere joyfully when we trust that we will ultimately prevail over suffering. The difference is our faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, this is what the, that is what the scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. We have no comprehension of how glorious eternal life will be for us because we're trapped in our own world. Failing to trust also leads to failing love. The kind of love Jesus taught was selfless love. We cannot obey his command to love one another if we're permanently concerned only about our own needs and wants. When the Sadducees tried to trap Jesus in that silly question concerning marriage in heaven, he stunned them with an answer. He says, marriage will be obsolete in all eternity after the resurrection. And that's our personal resurrection. In heaven, intimate selfless love Caring love will be shared among all people there, everyone who lives there. Now here on earth, however, we struggle to maintain a single relationship with a spouse, just one person. How many marriages are strained by individuals manipulating one another to meet their own personal needs? They resort to manipulation, control, sulking, yelling, blame, suffering, and other imaginable means of trying to get them to respond to us. The Lord teaches us to have priorities for others. It all comes back to faith. When we fail to trust the Lord to care for us, we fail to obey his most basic of all commands, 
John 15, 17, among many places in the Gospels, love one another. That's the most basic of all commands. And failing to trust leads to an unsteady peace. Jesus contrasted his peace with the world's tribulation. So his peace contrasted with world's tribulation. To have Christ and his peace in us is to have an ultimate fulfillment of that Hebrew shalom. And that's the life and fulfillment with abundance. That peace that we have. The peace with Christ will undoubtedly result in an estrangement and therefore possible persecution from the world. Nevertheless, tribulation will ultimately give way to overwhelming blessings in every case. And while we have this peace as a byproduct of God's grace, our ability to ex experience inner peace depends entirely on whether we're going to trust in the sovereign care and steadfast goodness of God. He has promised us tribulation, so why are we surprised when it happens? However, he promised us victories in this world, that the victories of this world are short-lived. He has overcome the world. Therefore, we may have peace to endure those short-term afflictions or suffering with the confident expectations of an ultimate triumph. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, exceeding anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The three key words to keep us going, joy, love, and peace, comes through trusting in him, giving us the strength that we need to carry on, knowing that the blessings, if not in this life, in all eternity, will be so much greater than what we could ever imagine here. And that's the lesson that Jesus is teaching his disciples and us today. Joy, love, and peace. Next Sunday, we'll study the actual Lord's Prayer as Jesus prays for his own glorification and for his disciples in a message that I've titled Divine Intercession. So please read John chapter 17, verses 1 through 19 in preparation for next week's message. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you. We thank you that you give us joy, love, and peace. We thank you that we can have these regardless of our situation in the world. As we go through times of trials and tribulation, we know that that's inevitable. But we just pray that through those, we'll still have joy, love, and peace. Then we will know that even during times of tribulation, that ultimately you will pull through, that you've given us everything that we need, that what you have prepared for us is beyond our imagination, Father. And let us today share that joy, love, and peace with everyone that we come in contact with, that we might build your kingdom, that we might see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.